you're having several lectures on various aspects of dark matter. And so uh, today, what I would like to say some complementary things and hopefully not uh, repeat uh, what Patty's already told you. And uh, I would like to cover uh, a few different mechanisms of dark matter production apart from just the thermal freeze out one that uh, he's been talking about for, for WIMPs. Although I, I would like to also say a few more things about uh, thermal freeze out as well. So I'm going to talk about, in addition, asymmetric dark matter freeze in uh, primordial black holes from inflation and uh, fuzzy, the, orig uh, the relic density for fuzzy dark matter or axions. It's uh, the same class of models. And uh, what all of these five kinds of uh, mechanisms have in common is they're all about cold dark matter. Uh, now I think Patty mentioned that warm dark matter was uh, one of the possibilities in this wide range. And it was one that some people like for solving the uh, apparent small scale structure problems of uh, cold dark matter, like the cusp core problem and the missing satellites problem. And, and that's because if the dark matter is warm, then it has a streaming length, which could be big enough to wipe out the structures on those scales. But uh, in recent years, uh, Lyman alpha uh, constraints have been making it more and more difficult for warm dark matter to be relevant. Uh, so you know, Lyman alpha is probing the structure of hydrogen gas clouds between us and distant quasars and showing how much power there is in, in the structure there and seeing that while well, that power isn't getting erased at those scales, and therefore warm dark matter has to be heavier than, say, 4 keV. Or it's, it's debated, but it's getting to the point where it's difficult to, uh, to invoke warm dark matter to get uh, a big enough streaming length to wipe out those small scales of interest. So I'm just going to focus on cold dark matter today. And I'll start with a few remarks about uh, the thermal freeze out uh, mechanism. So I believe one of them that wasn't mentioned by Patty, uh, so if, if you want to find the relic density of your favorite model very accurately, you could download uh, Micro Omega's software package or Dark Susie, but uh, suppose you don't want to do that. Um, then uh, I think uh, Patty didn't mention there is an analytic solution to the Boltzmann equation. It's an approximate analytic solution, which works pretty well. It's described in Colbin Turner. I meant to look up who's the, who originally did it. Somebody probably could remind me. But, uh, so he didn't show you this analytic thing, right? I'm not going to go through how it works. I'm just going to quote the result. And if you want to see the details, uh, you can look it up in Colbin Turner. Uh, or in the appendix of one of my papers that's a reference for a slightly improved version. And it provides a formula for the uh, present day abundance of a dark matter particle as square root of 45 over pi uh, g star and a quantity x sub freeze out. So x was m over t. This is the value of m over t at the freeze out temperature. And I'll specify that in a moment. And then there's an integer n that I will define. And then we have the mass of the dark matter particle. And then we have the big Planck mass. So that's the 1.22 times 10 to the 19 GeV. And we have the thermally averaged cross section uh, where n is equal to 0 for S-wave annihilation, 1 for P-wave, etc. And sigma v, uh, then you have to interpret this a little differently if n is not equal. If n is equal to 0, this is just the thermally average cross-section. Uh, but if n is equal to, to 1 or higher, then this is just uh, some constant where you've taken the velocity dependence out, 
and the, velo the average velocity dependence is showing up in this thing. So x freeze out, so that's uh, m over t at freeze out. That's also analytically determined to be logarithm of some other quantity minus yf minus half log log of yf. And that yf is the number of degrees of freedom of the chi particle. So for instance, 2 if it's a Majorana fermion over 2 pi cubed, square root of 45 over 8 g star. That's just coming from, well, the entropy uh, density, I guess. And then we have m chi m Planck sigma v times n plus 1. One is the M and the XF, is that the um, dark matter mass? Yes, so that I'm calling dark matter chi here. Also, I, I've never seen someone take the log of a log that way. It's just not something I've it's just like an unusual scenario. Yeah, and that's because uh, the real equation is some transcendental equation, and you're solving it by iteration. So this is the, the leading approximation. That's the next to leading, and, and beyond that, you don't care because this is good enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think basically none. The, the approximation I, I just mentioned here is very unlikely to break down if, if, if uh, yeah, because you take, start taking more logs, it gets to be a s smaller and smaller. Uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry? small. Uh, yeah, no, there's nothing, nothing needs to be particularly small. Yeah. Doesn't YF need to be greater than 1? Uh, if it's less than 1, you try and call the natural log of the natural log of something smaller than 1, you'll get the natural log of a negative number. Yeah, okay, so that's a, reg that's a boundary of validity for this. So, yeah, if I had the time to actually go through the method, but that would take like half the lecture, then it would become apparent to you. So my purpose here is not to really explain it all, but just to make you aware that this exists, and uh, you can look it up if you want more details. Yeah. Yeah, so re really I should call this thing sigma naught where it's a coefficient that appears in the thermally average cross-section. If I really need the thermally average, it's just for S wave, then this, they turn out to be the same. But again, see Kolb and Turner for the details. Now, there's another way which, uh, of uh, determining the relic density, which is even easier. And that is using the fact that uh, you know that the cross-section that you need to get the right relic density is roughly independent of the dark matter mass. But people have worked out uh, exactly what it is. And so here's, there was a paper by Steigman and Beacom and company who did it earlier. I think this more recent one in the Dark Susie paper is more accurate. So there used to be people would often use a rule of thumb. Uh, to get the right relic density, impose a canonical value of the, for the cross-section, sigma v, of 3 times 10 to the minus 26. And so that would give you, you know, a reasonable estimate. But if you want to do better, then depending on your dark matter mass, just match this cross-section. And that will give you a pretty good uh, estimate of... Uh, what you need for the right relic density. Uh, oh, and I should mention uh, that uh, this is the right number for self-conjugate dark matter. 
So if it's Dirac dark matter, then you need to double this. Or if it's a complex scalar, you need to double it. And there's an easy way to understand that in terms of, if you think about dark matter particle, its relic density is being determined by its rate of annihilation on other dark matter particles. If it's a Dirac particle, then it can only interact with half of the dark matter particles in the bath. So the rate of interaction is going down by a factor of two. You need to boost the cross-section accordingly in order to uh, compensate for that. And let's see, so, oh, yes, and uh, another thing I wanted to mention. So uh, Patty showed you the meaning of this thermal average. You just uh, weight the initial state particles by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and, and average over, uh, their, uh, over their momenta. But uh, in many cases, it's not really necessary. And especially for simple uh, S-wave annihilation, the cross-section is always going like a constant over V. And so sigma V is not very sensitive to the value of V for, for small velocities. And the velocity is relatively small when dark matter is freezing out, 0.3 or so. And so it's often sufficient to just omit doing this thermal average and just evaluate what this constant is. Uh, and, and that's very easy to do if you have, uh, so if I have a annihilation of <coughs> dark matter, and I'll, I'll just label their momenta, so dark matter going into some lighter particles, and if you know the, uh, the matrix element for that process, then you can easily work out that uh, sigma times the relative velocity is matrix element squared over 32 pi <coughs> mass of the dark matter squared. And then there's a phase space factor if the particles you're annihilating into aren't much lighter than the dark matter particles. And so uh, then you just have to compute the matrix element at, uh, at the threshold. So just take the dark matter particles to be annihilating at rest. And that gives a pretty good approximation. Um, and of course, you have to multiply by a half if uh, the final state particles are identical. Now, when would this be a bad approximation? So any time when you have strong dependence of the cross-section on velocity, obviously. And so one, one situation where you must do the thermal averaging to get decent results is if, uh, if you're uh, near resonance. So it, an S-channel resonance. Suppose we had dark matter annihilating into the Higgs boson, and the dark matter is approximately half the mass of the Higgs, uh, then, this, uh, then this intermediate propagator is going to go on shell, and you become very sensitive to uh, how close are you to the pole of the propagator. Uh, so there, you better do uh, the actual thermal average. And another place where, obviously, you have to do it is if it's not S-wave. Uh, if it's P-wave uh, or higher, you should thermally average. But again, if you going back to the uh, analytic uh, approximation, here you can avoid this because uh, because this thing is actually just a coefficient which is related to uh, the matrix element when you extract the velocity dependence and, and the averaging over powers of velocity has already been done in this formula. It's giving you this, this exponent. So uh, with this approximation, 
you can you can still avoid doing any thermal uh, ab averaging integrals. Now the other thing I wanted to say about thermal freeze out uh, concerns a different scenario uh, than WIMPs. Yeah, maybe I should just, sorry, uh, let me write this more explicitly. I have it in my notes. We can just write the actual expression. So this constant sigma naught is defined to be, uh, it's, it's defined such that sigma v uh, so now I'm forgetting. Maybe you do have to do the thermal averaging to find that constant, but uh, this is this is how it's defined. So the other uh, example of th thermal freeze out, which doesn't fit into this scenario is called a uh, strongly interacting massive particle. Are there some question about this first? Uh, no, you can. It's fine. Uh, there is no what? No you have to start from the P wave. Oh, yeah, but I mean this, so I mean P wave is covered by that formalism. It's just the value of N. Yeah. So there's, beyond WIMPs, there's SIMPs, uh, which means uh, strongly interacting massive particle. And this is a situation where uh, you don't have any uh, annihilation channel into uh, standard model particles. But instead, you could imagine that you have annihilation of three of the dark matter particles into, into two. And so this would be most, uh, so it's three to two annihilation occurring only in the dark sector. This would be most appropriate for a model uh, like composite dark matter in a hidden sector where these things are pions and uh, and, they, and you've broken any discrete symmetry that would require just an even number in their scattering. Uh, so that's kind of a canonical example of this. But uh, you can treat it in basically the same way as uh, two to two annihilation. You just have to now brush up on what is a, a three body cross what, what does it mean to have a cross-section with three particles in the uh, initial state? And uh, we're not used to thinking about it, of course, because it doesn't happen in, in colliders, but you can still define that quantity, and it's, it's something that has different dimensions. But in any case, we could estimate what's the relic density in this situation in the same way as uh, was done for, for WIMPs by the argument that uh, the rate of annihilation, uh, so imagine the rate of annihilation of a given dark matter particle, it's going to depend on the densities of the two others, and therefore we get an n squared instead of, uh, instead of uh, just n, as per the usual formula. And that equation shows you how the dimensionality for a 3 to 2 cross-section differs it has to uh, go like uh, one over mass to the fifth in order to absorb the, the extra density. And so, as usual, one uh, equates this to uh, the decay rate at a temperature which is of order the mass of the particle. Realistically, it should be somewhat lower maybe a factor of 10 or 20, because we've seen that freeze out always happens uh, not right at the particle mass, but uh, somewhat below it. But just for a parametric estimate, uh, that would give us 
something of order m squared over m Planck. And so then when you uh, equate these, you can solve for the relic density of the dark matter. And it has a different dependence. Instead of going like 1 over the cross section, it goes like 1 over the square root of the cross section. Now, interestingly, uh, let's see. Let's see, did I get this right? So that would mean that uh, the energy density, m times n, uh, so that would go like m squared over. Let's, let's imagine that we're in some hidden sector where there's just one mass scale. Like in QCD, the relevant mass scale is the confinement scale. Uh, and so let's call that mass scale M. And then we would, we would imagine that uh, sigma V goes like 1 over M to the, M to the fifth. Yes, OK. So then you can uh, set this equal to the uh, observed relic density and get an estimate uh, for the mass scale. And you find through this simple estimate something of order of GeV. When you do it more carefully, uh, it turns out to be smaller, say 100, 100 MeV or or less, but anyway, this is showing you that in this uh, scenario, you expect that the dark matter is going to be naturally lighter than in the WIMP scenario. Is to get. That was supposed to be an exponent. Thanks. It's, this is the dark matter mass again. OK, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, thermal relics. And next I would like to uh, mention the important non-thermal uh, mechanism, which is asymmetric dark matter. And I won't have a lot to say about it. It's, it's like the baryon asymmetry. Uh, we don't know what the origin of baryons are. It could well be that dark matter also has some conserved number, and it's arising from an asymmetry like the baryons. We have lots of ideas how that could happen, but uh, very little evidence about what's the likely, most likely mechanism. So I'm not even going to speculate about mechanisms. I'll just assume that chi has uh, a conserved uh, particle number. And by some means, it gets, a, it gets an asymmetry. So we could then talk about the two different components of the, the dark matter. There's the dominant one, uh, which would be, sorry, so let me talk about the asymmetric one as being the dominant one. So it'll be the max of uh, whatever is most prevalent, the, the dark matter or its antiparticle. And then there will typically be a non-negligible amount of the other kind. Unless, of course, uh, the annihilation. Uh, so you want there to be an annihilation of chi-chi bar into 
standard model particles typically. Uh, because, and you want this to be, uh, should, you want this to have a big cross section. It should have a large cross section because otherwise uh, there's no reason to expect that uh, this symmetric component is going to be much smaller than the asymmetric component, and then you're back to thermal dark matter. In other words, typically this particle will have had a thermal uh, origin, and we just want to uh, suppress its relic thermal density so that that's a negligible contribution in order to make this asymmetric mechanism uh, relevant. Okay, so that's the, the assumption, and therefore we know that this sigma v for this process is much greater than the, uh, the standard, so that's the standard value that we needed, which is of order 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cubed per, per second. Because a particle can always annihilate with its antiparticle. That's, that doesn't violate conservation of the particle. It's just, so we have baryons and antibaryons. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. It's just that there's no process that will change. So we haven't changed chi number here. We started with chi number zero and ended with, yeah. Uh, now, I just want to point out one possible conceptual error that you, you might be tempted to make when you're thinking about these kind of scenarios because, uh, because of this, this statement that, uh, so unless, well, I, I'm going to show you. So the question is, how, how big does this have to be in order to make the symmetric component completely irrelevant? And the relevance, of course, of this, the symmetric component is that uh, if we have these kind of processes still going on today, these can lead to indirect detection. And you'll have lectures uh, on that a little later on. And so it's interesting to know, well, how big does this cross-section have to be in order to make it unlikely for us to be able to see this at, in the present day? And uh, a naive estimate would be the, uh, the indirect, uh, the rate of indirect events will just be suppressed by the ratio of these two things because, of course, in the uh, standard thermal freeze-out, you know that the relic density is just going to go as the inverse of the cross-section. So you might think that is, okay, it's just going to be a proportionality, but that's not true. And the reason it's not true is because as we make this bigger and bigger, at some point, the symmetric, I mean, the asymmetric component uh, becomes important. And it doesn't go away. It stays the same no matter how big you make this. So it means that even if this is very big, a dark matter antiparticle, suppose that's the one that is uh, less likely, it can still find a dark matter particle much more easily than it could have if it was just purely thermal dark matter. And that means that indirect detection is suppressed much faster as a function of uh, this than um, that naive reasoning would have led you to believe. And so this was all worked out in a nice paper by Gresser et al. Uh, where they show you precisely what is the ratio of the, uh, the subdominant component to, so the symmetric to the asymmetric component in my language? Uh, what is that ratio as a function of this ratio of cross sections? So the actual cross section versus the standard value. And uh, you see the, uh, the answer here. It's going down uh, exponentially. It's not just. It's not just a power uh, inverse uh, power of this, but it's, uh, it's exponential. 
and this leads to a very quick suppression of the uh, signals from indirect detection. Uh, it's just this. It's the ratio of the uh, the two abundances, uh, current ratio. If you have a large cross section, doesn't that mean you should also have an increased chance of going of, of, of the inverse reaction, so like annihilating to produce dark matter anti dark matter pair? Not once you get below the mass of the dark matter. How massive is the dark matter we're talking about? Well, so you're talking about the inverse scattering? Yeah. No, as soon, that's Boltzmann suppressed. So as soon as, these are assumed to be much lighter than chi. So as soon as you get to temperatures such that uh, uh, much below the mass of the chi, then that's exponentially suppressed. Because th these things, they have energies of order of the temperature Oh, oh! I see through the inverse yeah. process. Yeah, I mean, usually people like uh, annihilation into B quarks in all of these uh, indirect detection papers. So if you had a B quark collider, then you might have good chances. Well, I'm being facetious, but uh, let's see. Oh, and uh, oh, and interestingly, uh, how am I doing on time? So interestingly, uh, to avoid bounds from the cosmic microwave background, uh, that imposes a lower limit on this cross section. So that's a little novel. Usually, we're used to thinking of getting upper limits on cross sections uh, from indirect detection. But for the CMB, we want, to, uh, we want to suppress this through this exponential penalty, so we need a bigger cross-section. And uh, the CMB limit is that sigma v has to be greater than about 10 to the minus 25 centimeter cube per second for uh, 10 GeV dark matter. Uh, or somewhat bigger, seven times bigger, for a one, uh, one MeV dark matter particle. That's from Zurich and company. You can find references in my notes, which are uh, online. Another way of constraining asymmetric dark matter, if it's bosonic, it likes to accumulate in the cores of black holes. And, uh, so if you get enough of them, that will cause collapse of the black hole. And so that puts an, a limit on the uh, cross-section of, of dark matter with nu on nucleons, because we need scattering of dark matter on nucleons to get trapping in neutron stars. And so neutron stars give an interesting limit on the chi nucleon uh, cross-section, uh, so it gets, let's see, so it, less than 10 to the minus 47 centimeters squared for uh, dark matter in the range of a uh, few MeV to 15 GeV. It's another Catherine Zurich paper. She's the queen of asymmetric dark matter. Um, and of course, that's interesting because that's in a, in a region that's very difficult for uh, underground uh, direct detection experiments to probe. OK, so uh, that's all I wanted to say about asymmetric dark matter. And now I'd like to talk about freeze-in. And this is, uh, this concept was introduced by Paul uh, Jadamzik, March, Russell, and West in 2009. 
the idea was, unlike thermal uh, freeze-out, imagine that you had a dark matter candidate that never came into thermal equilibrium. So suppose that it just, it was not produced during inflation and uh, very in inefficiently produced by interactions. So we're talking about dark matter that is generally very weakly interacting, more so than WIMPs. And so uh, its, actual, its actual density is starting out much smaller than uh, the equilibrium density. In that case, the Boltzmann equation simplifies. And we'll just write down the terms that only involve the equilibrium density. So the general form uh, is x times the entropy density times the cross-section divided by the Hubble parameter at the temperature equal to the mass of the particle. So normally this would be uh, y equilibrium squared minus, uh, minus y squared. But we're saying that uh, y, the actual abundance, is much smaller. And so we can make the approximation uh, that it's just this. And then the Boltzmann equation becomes much easier to solve because, because nothing depends on y on this side. We can just directly integrate it. Uh, it's, uh, let's see. Where is it? Where does it come in in the? Uh... I think it's just because it's a convenient parameterization, and you know how Hubble scales. It doesn't actually matter about the design. Yeah, that's true. I'm sorry. All of the temperature dependence is constant. Yeah, yeah. I I was just trying to remember when you when you re in, in originally derived this equation, where was the H? coming from. Yeah. But oh, oh, I remember why. Yeah, it's because we've traded time for, yeah. So remember, the original equation was in terms of T, but T is related to temperature uh, through the Hubble parameter. So it's just the constants that appear when you go, when you change from T to X, you know, there's a Jacobian, and it's, it's just the constants that appear in that uh, change of variables. Uh, but now, so when you, uh, when you look at this equation, uh, the solution to this equation, what you find is that, okay, so then you just do the integral. So you say that y chi is equal to the integral dx of this stuff. And what you find is that this is going like dx x squared times this modified uh, Bessel function uh, that's appearing in the definition of the equilibrium density. And you find that this is uh, dominated at, by small x. Which is high temperature. And that's unlike the uh, thermal freeze-out, where you know that uh, everything's being dominated by the contributions near the freeze-out temperature. So that means that uh, you have to be careful about what you use for sigma v here. You shouldn't use the low temperature limit. You should uh, use the high temperature behavior of sigma v to, to do this correctly. And typically, uh, that's going to be suppressed just by dimensional analysis, you expect that sigma v is going to go like 1 over temperature squared at high temperature. Uh, so it would be something of order lambda squared over t squared uh, because this propagator 
is getting small at high temperature. And we can write this as, uh, sorry, that should be lambda to the fourth. So we can write that as lambda to the fourth x squared over mass of the dark matter squared. Or yeah. Of the we never talk about the temperature of the dark matter in all of this. Okay. Uh, we don't care about its. Uh, we we only we're using temperature as a way of keeping track of time and uh, yeah and temperature of the of the part of the universe that's in thermal equilibrium. Uh, so now you can just plug this in and do the integral. And, uh, and you find that m chi times its equilibrium density is of order 10 to the minus 4 lambda to the fourth uh, m Planck. And if you compare this to the critical density expressed in, uh, well, yeah, if you compare this to what you need using the critical density, this is what you need. Then you can solve, uh, you can solve for lambda and find that it's of order 10 to the minus 6. So that's illustrating to you uh, this statement that we're talking about dark matter that's very weakly interacting here. So, uh, yes? Oh, you're saying I could get around this if I was if using it were scalars, it would be a just a phi to the fourth interaction. Yeah, so I guess maybe, yeah. So I've assumed something here. I haven't tried to analyze it for all possible cases. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, well, actually, so this, though, this wasn't taking into account any dependence on uh, sigma v. So, for instance, if sigma v was constant, I think this statement would still be true. In what sense do we need that? So, like, do we need this to the value of m times equilibrium density to be equal to this? This is not equilibrium density. This is the current density. This is what you get from doing this calculation. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you, you might want to check how does this argument change if you have bosonic uh, with a contact interaction. It's just interesting that uh, if you tried to do thermal freeze out with such a large value, uh, you would need a very l low uh, dark matter mass. Uh, so with thermal freeze out, sorry if this is too low to see, uh, such a weak interaction uh, would imply would imply a dark matter mass of order 0.1 eV. Anyway, it's just a very different regime from, uh, from freeze out. Now, I will mention one other, here I'll, I'll trade these boards. I'll mention one other example that's come up recently. I think it's interesting because the nightmare scenario for dark matter, it doesn't interact with anything. Except it always interacts gravitationally. And so it's interesting that you can uh, have freeze-in to give the right relic abundance, even for particles that interact only gravitationally. And this was pointed out in some papers from 2015 and 2017 by Martin Sloth and collaborators. 
And that's an example where the temperature dependence is, is different. So gravitational interactions only. Uh, then we would have exchange of a graviton here. Um, but uh, we know the scaling is going to be different because it's non-renormalizable, and these vertices come with powers of the energy and the momentum and inverse powers of the Planck mass. So in that case, we know that sigma v is actually going to scale with positive powers of the temperature. Um, let's see. But oh, obviously, it's still the case that the integral is going to be dominated by the high temperature contributions. So. Uh, that statement doesn't change. And, uh, and what these author, authors estimate is that you can have uh, dark matter with masses as high as 10 to the 16 GeV. That's uh, the upper limit they find. Of course, you may still ask, well, who cares, because we'll never be able to uh, see that dark matter. But uh, these authors at least point out one possibility, and that is uh, we often invoke global symmetries to, uh, to uh, ensure this or explain the stability of dark matter. And yet uh, we believe that gravi quantum gravity doesn't respect global symmetries uh, and that uh, quantum black holes will, uh, would make such dark matter, or quant uh, uh, gravitational instantons might make such dark matter particles unstable. And so these authors uh, discuss the possibility that uh, such gravitational effects might lead to uh, slow decays of dark matter into standard model particles due to uh, quantum gravity. Uh, effects. So perhaps it's not hopeless to uh, see dark matter even in the nightmare scenario. And that's all I want to say about freeze-in. The next thing on my list was primordial black holes, which have uh, gained interest recently because of the LIGO observations. LIGO seeing uh, <coughs> seeing events indicating that uh, maybe there's more 30 solar mass black holes out there than one would have uh, expected. And so we'll use this uh, as a, a target mass because it's known to be, that's one of the windows that's not excluded by uh, macho searches and other constraints on primordial black holes. And many astronomers are fond of this scenario because they say, oh, this requires no new physics. It seems like a very conservative dark matter candidate. But uh, what they fail to realize is that in order to produce these things at the needed relic density, you really, de you really do need new physics. And so that's the part I want to just mention to you uh, right now. And uh, so uh, the way you would relate this, uh, well, black hole of a certain mass. Yes? In principle, they could be, yeah. And, well, the way you would imagine getting um, dark, uh, getting primordial black holes of a given mass is uh, from, you would need, so you would need a very rare density fluctuation uh, coming from inflation. Uh, this, 
in ordinary inflation, the, uh, the density perturbation is a Gaussian uh, variable. So it's, this is some Gaussian random field. And that statement is true mode by mode in uh, Fourier expansion. And so you would need some rare, flu rare upward fluctuation of that. Uh, you would need it to be of order one in order to uh, produce a black hole. Um, so you need a big fluctuation. And the mass that you would produce would be basically the amount of mass contained in a region uh, whose wavelength corresponds to this k number. So that would give a, uh, a mass which is of order the critical density times the wavelength cubed or divided by uh, k cubed. And so if you just take the, uh, the spectrum, the power spectrum for this that we've deduced from inflation, of course, from inflation, we don't deduce it. And this defines, so this defines a particular scale. If I want a 30 solar mass black hole, that tells me what wave number I need to, uh, I need to be concerned with. And those are very short, uh, short wavelengths that we don't probe directly from the CMB. But if we assume that the power of those fluctuations was the same at those wavelengths as what we measure in the CMB, then we would find that this kind of fluctuation is it's just impossible. It's, it's super exponentially suppressed. And what it means, therefore, is that we need to have a boost in the power uh, on those scales compared to what we measure in inflation. And I won't draw that because I have this nice picture from a paper by Bringman et al. Uh, there's my stick. And this is a picture of constraints on, on black holes uh, where we have uh, the uh, wave number going from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the 19th inverse megaparsecs on the bottom and the uh, scalar power spectrum on the, the top. So these are the wave numbers measured by the CMB and, and this is the magnitude of the power uh, at those scales from COBE. This line is showing you what you would need in order to get uh, primordial black holes at, at the observed relic density. And uh, some of these regions are uh, excluded. So macho searches and, and Lyman alpha uh, exclude this range of black holes. Uh, the ones that LIGO sees are uh, here. And uh, yeah, I think macho searches, I forget. So there, there are a bunch of different constraints which are uh, ruling out some of these regions. But the main point to take home here, even though uh, this is allowed, it's showing you that you would need a huge increase in the power uh, from these scales to these scales. It's not just going to be some simple uh, power law, probably, that's accounting for that. And it is possible. So one way to do that is to have a, uh, a step potential during inflation. And so if you, if you imagine that the inflaton potential for some reason had a discontinuity, then it's not too difficult and it's left as an exercise in uh, the problem set I, I put online to show that 
you get a big boost in power right at the scales that correspond to uh, horizon crossing uh, of, of these modes. And so uh, that would be a way of producing a spike in the power where you want it. Uh, and it turns out to get a big enough spike, and this is also part of the exercise, uh, that you need uh, the step to change the potential by a factor of, a, of order 10. I mean, what you really need quantitatively, though, it's extremely fine-tuned because all of, all of this is going into uh, a Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian uh, probability distribution function for delta rho over rho. And so any little change here is exponentially amplified. And so to get just the right amount of power on that scale, you really have to have this tuned carefully. And so you see there's two contrived things going on here, this special feature in the uh, potential and also you know, exactly how big the, the drop is. Yes? That looks like it represents a spectacular violation of slow roll. What does that mean? Not mean that like all the... Well, well it's, it's rolling slowly here and then... Well, it, yeah, it picks up a little speed there, but uh, it, it also quickly Hubble damps when it gets down here. So you can, join, you can join the two slow roll solutions onto each other, and that's part of the problem, is to show how to do that matching. Do you have discontinuity in your derivatives as well, or do you have a condition patch on the cross, so you don't have a step function in your v prime, for example? No, the slow roll equation is a first order equation, and, oh, but... Uh, no, I forget. The details are all in that exercise. I'll let you. There's a question. Uh, I was just wondering, so the minimum is at 5 equals 0? So about how inflation Oh, this is just, you know, a part of inflation that we don't even observe. And the part that we do observe is happening somewhere later on. Through multiple discontinuities? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't see how it would get rid of the fine tuning. Um, it would give you it would give you several spikes at different wave numbers. Yeah. No, I I, I was uh, Uh, well, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that the actual power that you get out is exponentially sensitive to how big the jump is. Yeah. Whether it's a, whether it's discontinuous or not, I think it's still going to be rather fine tuned. Yeah. So I feel like I'm hearing that there's a minimum mass for primordial black hole dark matter things from like evaporation. Like if the primordial black holes were smaller than a certain mass, then you'd have like they, they would evaporate due to Hawking radiation right. too quickly, and you wouldn't still see them. I, but there's no lower bound on this that I see. Is this just not represented on here? Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's where the line ends. Well, that's increasing mass. Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the problem, like how sharp the drop would be, like would that flatten a little bit, like say if it happens in a certain web, then would that um, greatly damp the, the spike that generated? I, I don't know if it would damp it, it would spread it out. Um, I don't know, I've never done this calculation. Sure. Black holes can eat anything. Anyway, my take on this is that uh, it's possible to, to make it work, but it seems like several unlikely things are, are going on here. 
So the final uh, possibility I want to mention is the uh, fuzzy dark matter or axion-like particles. And I, I think this doesn't uh, overlap with Anson Hook's coming lectures because uh, I don't believe he was going to talk too much about the uh, origin of the relic density. So uh, Patty did mention fuzzy dark matter. And uh, these are really just another uh, regime of axions, not the QCD axion, but a more general uh, axion-like particle uh, where one takes the potential, well, let me show a picture of the potential. So this is supposed to be a uh, tilted Mexican hat potential. And uh, if Pacheco symmetry was not broken, then it wouldn't be tilted. It would be an exact symmetry, and the axion would be a true Goldstone boson. So we're interested here in, uh, oh, but uh, yeah, for my purposes, the tilt, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, the tilt is still important, obviously. We need the, we need the axion to get a mass. Uh, so it's convenient to parameterize it. Since you see it's running around, it's living on a circle. It's convenient to think of it as being a dimensionless angular, angular variable. Uh, and I'll just follow. Witten and company and call it A. Uh, and the effect of this tilt in the potential is, is just a cosine kind of potential. We have two scales here. Uh, so there's a scale F that's known as the decay constant of the axion. And then there's uh, another scale here which is associated with this breaking effect, the, the lifting of the uh, potential. And you can easily see, you can work out by expanding in A that the axion mass is just lambda to the f lambda squared over F. Um, and I guess uh, it's already been stated, but in the case of QCD, we're usually interested in masses uh, in the range of 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 2 uh, EV. But the possibility of uh, dark matter being much lighter than that, down to 10 to the 22 minus EV, that was uh, emphasized by this paper by uh, Witten et al., Hui, Ostreicher, Tremaine, and Witten in uh, 2016. Um, actually, that, that wasn't the first. Uh, there was an earlier paper by uh, Hu, Barkana, and Gruzinov in, back in 2000 uh, that was, I think, the first to suggest uh, this much lower mass scale of 10 to the minus 22 EV that's uh, identified with fuzzy dark matter. And uh, Patty already mentioned the motivation for that scale. It's that the uh, de Broglie wavelength of the particle then becomes of order kiloparsec. So 1 over m, I guess, is of order uh, kiloparsec. And so it means that with this kind of dark matter, you cannot form structures on smaller scales. Uh, and so that would be good for this cusp core problem. Yeah. The lambda? No, the theta. Oh, that's A. I'm just calling the field A instead of theta. So A is the axion. Yeah. 
in a dimensionless form. Uh, because I've expressed it as a dimensionless quantity. But if you prefer, uh, the, the way people usually uh, normalize it is to absorb the F into the A here and then div divide right A over F there. It's just a notation. Uh, so the part I want to talk about uh, in this lecture is how the relic density comes about. And so probably many of you are already familiar uh, with this misalignment mechanism. Uh, yeah, in fact, so that's one of the interesting things about this is that you can have Bose-Einstein condensation. And, uh, so that's part of the whole study of this kind of dark matter. And it's also part of the controversy about axions, whether you can have Bose-Einstein condensation for QCD axions. Uh, there's some debate in the literature on that subject. Uh, so I want to talk about the misalignment mechanism. And it's very simple. The idea is that uh, you started out in the early universe at temperatures such that the tiny energy difference between uh, the true vacuum and other places on the vacuum manifold is just irrelevant. And so you can just easily populate by, uh, by random chance any place on this vacuum manifold and find yourself uh, in a universe because there'll be fluctuations of the axion field uh, and you'll find yourself after inflation in a region where the field is just taking a random value. So, so during inflation, just like any other massless field, the axion field is going to have fluctuations of order h. And if h is, is large enough, uh, well, actually it doesn't matter because the origin of the axion field is, is kind of irrelevant at, at these scales. So everywhere on that vacuum manifold is going to get populated. And at the end of inflation, we expect that these regions with different values have gotten blown up uh, to encompass our horizon. And we'll just have an initial value of the axion field that is uh, anywhere. So, and uh, during the early, as long as, uh, even after inflation, as long as the mass of the axion is less than the Hubble parameter, it remains frozen. So the universe is cooling. The axion is uh, evolving very slowly so that it's approximately frozen. But as soon as we reach the point uh, when they're equal, then it starts to budge. It starts oscillating around its minimum. And one can show that uh, an oscillating coherent field like that starts to just redshift uh, like uh, dark matter. And so putting those statements together, we can easily estimate what's the uh, energy density of the axion today. So let's see. At, uh, so initially, the energy density of the axion was just due to uh, this uh, lambda to the fourth potential. 
So it's of order lambda to the fourth. And it stays that way until it reaches this oscillatory, uh, this oscillatory phase. And then it starts redshifting. So there, so, uh, so after m equals h, we have that rho is going as rho initial, uh, and then it goes down like a cubed. So a initial over a cubed. And in particular, the current value of rho will go like this. And now we can just uh, replace these with temperatures. So that'll be T naught over T initial, uh, T initial cubed. So that's, that's the, uh, the density today. And we also know what T initial is because it's coming from Oh, sorry. Uh, not, I don't want T initial here. I want, I want the epoch when it starts oscillating. Uh, let's call it OS, OSC. Because it didn't, it didn't start redshifting until then. But we know what that is because it's when the mass of the field is of order the uh, temperature squared over M Planck. So we have everything that, uh, oh, yeah, we have everything that we need. And you can then easily show that the, uh, so the relative contribution to the density of the universe, dividing by the critical density, uh, turns out to be of order 0.3 times the mass of the particle uh, to the one half and f squared divided by some uh, some benchmark values. So for fuzzy dark matter, uh, one would like to think of the mass as being of order 10 to the minus 22 eV. And that tells you then you want the decay constant to be around 10 to the 16 GeV. Or I could rearrange the numbers and uh, write a mass more appropriate for axions, say 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. And then that would tell me that I want a decay constant closer to 10 to the 12 GeV. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I, I should put one caveat. So this whole misalignment mechanism, there's an underlying assumption here. It assumes uh, that the, uh, the shift symmetry of the axion whatever you want to call it, it for the case of QCD axion, it's the Pache-Quinn symmetry. That symmetry was already broken at a very high scale above inflation or during inflation. Um, because we're assuming that we had this, uh, that there was no phase transition. But, uh, that doesn't have to be the case. And in particular, for the QCD axion, it could be that there's a phase transition uh, happening after inflation, uh, the, which we would call the Pache-Quinn phase transition. And that's where this, this lambda potential, initially it's zero, but it suddenly appears due to some uh, strong dynamics in, the case of the axion is QCD instantons. And I just want to mention that if the, uh, the symmetry breaks uh, at a lower scale, then you can get additional contributions to the axion density uh, because you're going to be able to form cosmic strings uh, where the axion field is winding around. So, you can get cosmic strings. And 
In some Axion models, you can also get domain walls that are connected by the cosmic strings. And anyway, the decay of the strings leads to extra uh, contributions to the thermal axion, to the uh, axion particles. And so this increases the density uh, relative to the estimate that we've made here. And uh, so that's an, un that's an important uncertainty in uh, trying to understand quantitatively the relic density of axions today. And to do it properly, it requires numerical simulations of uh, axion string networks, just like people do cosmic string uh, simulations uh, or have in the past. It looks like we've got it's effectively burned energy. And that's the only thing we're relying is just does not depend on your scale. Sorry, I didn't uh, I didn't get that. Before it starts oscillating. It's still frozen. Yeah. Uh, is about oh, oh, you're saying, no, yeah, it looks like dark. Yeah, well, it is. It's just, that's all it is. It's just a potential. It's, it's like a inf little inflaton, but it's not dominating the energy density. Yeah. I think here there's also, also hidden assumption that the ax the axon like particle gets a mass right after phase transition. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one should probably be careful for for a particular model to be sure that no but uh i think i think the temperature dependence of the axion mass is such that it very rapidly goes to zero uh when you're close to that phase transition yeah i think our true phase transition one is a pedrocrin symmetry phase transition ah, is, is the comfortability one oh the oh i see the qcd yeah. uh oh i see so okay. That's how we not get the mass around before QCD. Yeah. Okay, so one should be careful about the real temperature dependence of the uh, the axion mass. Yeah. In all of this, I was I was saying this was the assumption. Uh, if, if it's not true, then this this potential that this lambda to the four potential just isn't there yet. It only arises after the uh, symmetry breaking. Oh, well, or or before. It doesn't have to be during. If it's after, then we're in this situation where you have cosmic string networks, and then it's a, it, this is an extra contribution that wasn't taken in, into account here. Because you're producing big coherent objects which eventually are going to uh, decay and give you extra contributions to the dark matter density. Okay, well, I guess I'm done, and uh, it's been a pleasure uh, interacting with you, and thanks for all your nice questions.